Hello, everyone, and welcome to Generation the Podcast, the audio companion to the HBO Max original series, Generation. I'm Gigi Good, Zoom supermodel and internet drag queen. Incredible. Hard to live up to, but I am Wembley Sewell, editor-in-chief of Them. Today, we're talking to Chloe East, who stars as Naomi, and Sono Patel, who wrote for the season of Generation. But first, episode seven. Gigi, can you give us a rundown of, of everything that happened in this episode? Oh my gosh, I thought you'd never ask. Episode seven is so fun to me on so so many different levels. We have a hotel party, which when I was in high school would have just been so much fun to do, especially with a a GSA. And we kind of return to the same structure as episode one in that you see the same situations almost from every single person's perspective, which again, I love. You know, there's truth or dare, which leads to someone's mouth on the toilet seat and um, a controversial three-way kiss. There's dancing, there's a pool party, and we finally see what all the sexual tension with Riley and Greta has been leading up to. Finally, Ms. Chester reveals himself to Sam, which makes for quite the alarming ending, to say the least. I say this every week, because it's true. There's just simply a lot going on. And for me, this was in many ways like my dream episode, because I think this is really when it all comes to a head. And watching the way it does so and how it impacts every single character really, to me, is a, is a, is a joy to watch. I mean, it's painful in many ways, just based on things that we will touch on later. Yes. <laughs> I think one of the characters that I've been watching really, really closely is Naomi. So, Chloe, it is a gift, a pleasure, and an honor to be with you here today. Thank you. I can't believe you guys are having me on for the seventh episode. I think this is a, <laughs> a, a favorite for a lot of people. So I feel very special and privileged to be able to talk about this episode. I'm so excited. It was so fun. Oh, yay. We're so excited to have you. Um, I mean, I, let's just jump right in. Um, yeah, first, Chloe, I want to talk about you specifically um, and your relationship to Naomi, the character. And um, I just have to say, you you play her very convincingly. You are so talented, and it's so fun to watch you on screen. And um, But I want to know what you go through to become Naomi. And um, on, on the other hand, like, how are you different than her? Yeah, well, playing Naomi has been... A, a very different experience for me. I feel like every other character I've played, I've, I'd had to work hard. And I, I hate to <laughs> say this as an actor, but like there is something in me. I am very, let me be clear. I'm very different from Naomi, but <laughs> the way she's written, there's something that clicks inside of me that like I read it on the page and I just know how you become it. she would say it. And there's not a lot of struggle, I think, with like, how is she going to say, you know, <laughs> let's go to Potato Corner or something. It's just, <laughs> it's honestly a little disgusting. The things that I say during my improv, I'm like, oh my gosh, where is this coming from? I am not <laughs> her. But... She is so fun to play. I've never played a character that just lets all of her guards down and and is just able to be super vulgar and inappropriate. She's so sassy. Yeah, sassy and very matter of fact in nearly everything. She mm-hmm. she's she very is blunt. we'll we'll get to it more, but like throughout this episode you see that she's she's kind of grounding other people by kind of telling them like it is and um you know getting shit done. But I, I have to ask because your character is also rooted in her relationship with Nathan. So I'm curious, do you have any siblings? Yes, I have two brothers. I have two older brothers. Oh older brothers. Yes. Okay, so no, no I love twin. Them. No, no twin brother. Um, I'm the baby. <laughs> love that. Yes. I, being able to play uh, twins to Yuli has been so fun. There's a twin dynamic you have to play into. It's like this other element of a relationship that 
I'd never really thought about. It's like when you're a twin, you have this twin connection. You grow up with this person. And I, of course, I grew up with my brothers, but they were older. They were in high school when I was in elementary school. It was just a different dynamic. We did different things. And I feel like Naomi and Nathan were very, very close, at least up until the beginning of the season. When it all came crashing down. <laughs> yeah, it all came crashing <laughs> down. And we know why. <laughs> Watching yeah, the show. We yes. know why. Yes. We know why. But yeah, my relationship, I don't think I could exactly connect like my relationship to my with my brothers to like mm-hmm. my relationship with Nathan. It's just and I think Yuli has said the same thing too. He's like, I can't relate to that relationship type also that's not my impression of Yuli. <laughs> <laughs> but so we'll play a clip for comparison to see how that <laughs> yeah. but um but yeah it's just this new thing we are both kind of in it together we're like okay let's 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 do this that's amazing i think you you both have like a really fantastic dynamic to watch play out even when it's not you know when it's not all roses and sibling love um, yeah. and i think one of the best parts of watching things between Naomi and Nathan be so tense is that we also get to see on the flip side Naomi just being like a rock solid friend I really want to play this scene where Naomi Delilah and Ariana are all (laughs) horsing around in that hotel room and Naomi is just like really trying to console Ariana after she feels rejected by none other than of course Nathan so let's play that clip you deserve better. I once saw him jerk off to a girl from a college admissions catalog. He's gross. Hi, I'm a man. I take everything I want. I'm just a <laughs> selfish, <laughs> shitty, bitch boy man. Hi, I'm another man. <laughs> I need to stick stuff in holes and, and punch myself in the face. Yeah. <laughs> me too, me too, me too. <laughs> <laughs> So fun. So fun. So fun. I mean, who amongst us has not, you know, punched a pillow saying all the same things? Um, joking. But <laughs> I want to know what, what you think in your in your heart of hearts that this absolutely wild scene, but also endearing scene, reveals about Naomi. I think you said it. I think it's really endearing. I think she prioritizes her friends over everything. And I think when you're that age, that's just something you kind of do. You find your group and you want to tell them about your family life or what's going on. And you feel like your friends are going to be there forever and that they're, (laughs) you know, you're your ride or die. And then you (laughs) graduate and you never talk to them again. But like in those moments, it's like that is your person. And I think Naomi's just very loyal to her friends and is very distant from Nathan. So she's even more loyal to her friends and wants to have their back. And it's such a sweet scene. I, I want to be at that slumber party. I want to be there. <laughs> All the time. Yes. I mean, you, it, you're right. I mean, she, it is, it's endearing and it, she almost seems to be like the middle ground, you know, with everyone. Like so far, there hasn't really been anything that she's done to upset anybody you know what I mean so like she's kind of been there in the middle to to help and be there uh for everybody but um we have Sono here hey diva (laughs) how are you uh wonderful how are you I'm fabulous um I'm I'm so curious to hear the sort of behind the scenes process about this scene and I guess kind of the show as a whole as you've have you as you've worked on it but what i want to know about this scene in particular um what do you think that this scene is about for you like what does it represent for you i think chloe hit on this which is like those enduring friendships are not enduring actually not enduring friendships those friendships <laughs> which feel life and death and you would kill yeah, for they them feel and then you, enduring in the yes. moment they feel like the most significant thing and then two years later you don't talk to those people but i think that that's the spirit of it and You know, what I love about this show in general is I think a lot of teen shows live in the soap and the drama and the fighting, but this show takes the space to really celebrate those moments of like harmony and friendship and dancing in the bathroom and all that kind of stuff. And this is one of those scenes where it's like them enjoying each other, even in this moment where she's been rejected a little bit. So I think that that's sort of the the heart of what this scene is. Yeah. And I want to take a bit of a uh, a zoom out um, because at this point uh, we've 
talked to Yuli, we've talked to Martha, and now obviously, I mean, so now we have you here, and oh, Chloe, the whole family we here. We've now talked to the whole family. <laughs> family. I want to start with you, Sono. But when you imagine, you know, Naomi's role in this very complex family, how do you think she kind of stands out or like breaks free and kind of defines her own distinct space amongst a crew of folks who have very, very big personalities and a lot of stuff going on. I think Naomi, I mean, you see it in six a little bit, you know, when she and Martha get in that wonderful fight as they're getting on the bus. Like she knows that sort of Nathan is taking all the air out of the room right now, but she's not going to be quiet or sit in the corner or whatever. She has her own life. She has her own friends. She has her own relationships, her own crushes. And even though, uh, you know, he's going through a lot and she cares about him, he she's living her own life. She's living her own teenage life. So this scene is a great example of that where Ariana has her relationship with Nathan, but so does Naomi. And the, the two don't necessarily have to rely on each other. Naomi can be a really good friend to Ariana, even though Nathan's her brother, you know? There is something in that dynamic. Like, it all hit me. Like, when the, when she has to be the one to film all, you know, oh Chester, my goodness. Nathan, and Ariana making out. I was just like, oh, my God, is she internally just gagging? Just like, dead. <laughs> oh. Definitely. Very painful. Oh, <laughs> seeing that. Oh my goodness. Disgusting. (laughs) Naomi's just at the effect of everyone's problems, it seems. Mm -hmm. It's like, she doesn't have these, what it seems to be like, big problems, I guess. Uh, You see like Nathan has more of a news headline issue and he, you know, jumps off of a yacht. But I think there's a lot of emotional stress that she has to go through with the baby with her brother, with her best friend. And it's like, these are all the big issues, but they're not necessarily directed towards her, but she's at the effect of like just being hit by other people's problems. And then at the same time, she's still trying to look perfect and she's trying to like, (laughs) you know, party and have fun. But I think she's also just a little lost in her priorities and like just emotions of a high schooler. Yeah, and she definitely makes more room for herself in the second half of this season. I'm not going to ruin anything, but there's something coming. Just wait. We're talking about episode seven of the HBO Max series, Generation. And we're going to get into a lot more after a quick break. Hey everyone, welcome back. We're talking to series writer Sono Patel and Chloe East, who stars as Naomi. I'm curious about what was happening in the writer's room for this episode, and a follow-up to that really quick is, this might be a dumb question for me, but like I'm I'm very um, not, I don't know much about like the writing room process, but I'm curious, like, do you ever find yourself needing to sort of act out these scenes as you're writing to see if they'll work or not? Or is that like, not? (laughs) Take us us through your process. (laughs) Take us through the process, Sono. (laughs) Well, this episode in particular is a little bit of a climax for a lot of the things we've been setting up all season. Um, A lot of the storylines, you know, Sam and Chester have a moment. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, we've talked about some of these things. We've talked about Greta and Riley and a lot of things are sort of coming to a head. So I would say that this episode... We, we had been planning for a while. We didn't know how exactly we were going to get there, you know, what the exact moves were going to be. We didn't necessarily know going in that it was going to be at the motel or that they were going to get stuck on their trip or whatever. But we sort of knew emotionally where we wanted to be headed. And so that became sort of the spine of the episode. And then in terms of sort of bringing the authenticity that the, I think this show really prides itself on, the, a lot of the people in the room uh, – were in high school and went on these kinds of trips. And so it was like really mining those experiences. And, and I remember we were talking about, you know, what, what's the best part of going on a field trip when you're that age? And it's, it's like, yeah, you kind of remember seeing the Liberty Bell maybe, but it's not that it's like, you (laughs) know, it's, it's like sneaking out of your room. (laughs) Exactly. Like nobody, I, at 16, I did not care. It's about like sneaking out after lights out and like hanging out with your friends all night. And so the, the idea of having this entire episode just be at the motel felt like 
what a great opportunity for these kids to be together. And there, there are adults around, but they're not parents. You know, they're not quite as mm-hmm. like Megan's not around. There's some liberties that can be taken there. Um, <laughs> quite. Yeah. Quite some liberties. A and lot then, of liberties without. without a <laughs> lot of liberties. <laughs> okay, wait. But, okay, so... Uh, this is just like a little tidbit. When you guys went on high school field trips, did they ever like tape you into your rooms, like put tape on the door? <gasps> what? Not me, but one of our writers brought that up. They would put tape on yes. them so they would know if you opened the door. Because if you open broken. the door, you can't you can't retape it when you close the door. And the same thing happened on Drag Race too, which maybe I shouldn't talk about. But um, it's <laughs> <laughs> it's just like next that, on that's this crossover. <laughs> Max Altarelli, who's on who's on the writing staff, he said they would bring painter's tape. They would bring like eight different colors of painter's tape and they were like, we just would just... Just so you can match it Just up. in case. I was like, that's ingenious. That's so Brilliant. clever. Brilliant. Brilliant. Innovators. <laughs> Very clever. <laughs> but while, while you were saying all of this, I don't know if you noticed, but I just, I covered my eyes because I was just fl- having flashbacks to everything <laughs> that has happened in this episode. And I considered... Raising my voice at this point, um, I considered yelling. I considered Uh-oh. throwing a fit. I feel like here we go. <laughs> I feel like Gigi already knows where this is going, and I don't need to grandstand <laughs> anymore. But so no, I personally want to begin a fight with you because <laughs> oh no, how in the world did you allow this to happen to Greta and Riley? Look, I was. Waiting, <laughs> sweating, anticipating, standing, shipping, dreaming about, mm-hmm. obsessing over this couple. And I was so ready for that moment to blossom. And I feel like the answer is going to be like, of course, like, of course we had to do this. But can you walk us through that decision with you, the writers, the reactions? Chloe, if you want to weigh in, like, I welcome any kind of emotional support through this moment. But- <laughs> She needs well, it. I'm with you. I stand them. I I love them. <laughs> I just need some help, and maybe maybe so. No, you can help me. Someone I console hear her. You. Look, this was a long conversation. <laughs> there were a lot of feelings about it. What I'll say is this: this is episode seven of sixteen. You know, the story's not done. TBD. What happens there? But also, I think another thing that we've talked about in the room a lot is like, especially when you're younger, being able to articulate how you feel to the person they actually care about is so hard and being able to like have a healthy romantic relationship is so hard and you stumble and make mistakes and make choices that seem like they're the exact opposite of the choice you want to make or I mean I personally am like still like why did I say that thing that I said 15 years ago why would I say that in that moment and so I think that oh my god (laughs) you know what I mean like there are all those moments whether it's in a romantic context or not where you just wake up in the middle of the night (laughs) Where you're like, what? (laughs) Where did that come from in my brain? Why did I react that way to that thing? And again, I think that that's like a big part of what Zelda wanted to bring to this show is all those moments of like, what the fuck was that? (laughs) Like, why did I do that? And then what is what's on the other side of that? I mean, see what happens in the next few episodes and how because they still go to school together, right? Like they still see each other. There's the story's not over for them. I'm not going to say what does or doesn't happen, but it was a deliberate choice, which we knew some people would react strongly to me. (laughs) But I think it was also, you know, we didn't want to make it like TVify it and make it something cleaner than it maybe would be. Uh, you seem not satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm I'm satisfied. I think, and look, I mean, did you maybe you want to go first while I process if you have an immediate reaction? Well, you know what? Uh, obviously, I am very emotionally invested in these characters' relationships. Um, but I do also understand that this is high school. <laughs> and you know what? I You know, I just don't think Greta was ready for all of this jazz to be going on. And um, quite frankly, I feel like it's not over yet. Hold on to that one, please. No, I don't. (laughs) I'm holding on to hope, like I said. But I think maybe I think I'm perhaps coming from a bit of an emotional space, clearly, because they both clearly really like each other. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think the show is so uh, and all of you as writers are so intentional about the words you use and Greta said something that really stuck out to me. You know, I'm not like you. And she said that before she said kind of anything else. And in that kind of dynamic, when, you know, maybe it's the first girl you're with, when, you know, you're exploring 
something you've never explored before, that's like a dagger, you know, Mm -hmm. because you also don't fully know who you are yet either. But just that, you know, almost immediate admonishment is so loaded and and so heavy and can be interpreted so many different ways. Like, I, I think we can all kind of glean that she was saying, you know, I don't just like hook up right away. But there are so many different ways you can you can see that. And I think when, you know, Riley goes and just runs into another kind of situation, it kind of becomes clear it's not necessarily about identi- identity, but it's just so, I don't know, if you can talk me off of this. <laughs> well, it's interesting that you bring up that line because I think, you know, that it's it is told that scene is told from Riley's point of view and it is she takes it as a dagger. But I also think looking at Greta and her arc, I'm not like you is also like I'm not as confident in myself. I'm not as, I'm not there yet sexually. I'm not, I think that it is said with um, a little bit of a sharp tongue, but there's also something she admired. There's a lot she admires in Riley, you know? And like Riley's able ability to like go and say what she wants, go and do what she wants, go and get what she wants. Greta doesn't have that yet. And so that line I think is a really dynamic. It's, it's a hard thing to say to somebody. It means so many different things at once. Um, And I think from Greta's point of view, it has, different meaning than the way that Riley hears it, maybe. Without getting into spoilers again, I do think, like, they both have a little bit of growing to do on their own before they're maybe ready to be together in a, in a bigger way. Well, love to yearn, so. <laughs> love to yearn. Le- le- just for a second, let's let uh, Wembley blow off a little bit of steam and shift gears a little bit <laughs> and talk about the other kind of tension we have going on in this episode between Chester and Sam, which is um, quite questionable. But early in the episode, they are making dinner together, and the, vi- <laughs> the vibe is um, kind of flirty. Let's, let's play the clip really quick and talk about it. The thing about Paris is Burning is, like, it was made by some rich white woman who took on black and brown stories, and, like, did she really share the gold with them? I was going to ask her about it, and that probably wouldn't have made you mad. You would not have made me mad, assuming you weren't going to be a bitch about it. Oh, I'm always a bitch. Two-thirds of the time. Oh, the shade. <laughs> what about the other third? Uh, you know what I think I told you. What? You know. No, seriously, what? That you're the person I wish I'd been when I was younger. Okay, so maybe not kind of flirty. Maybe it was very flirty. Um, (laughs) But I want to know what is going on here and how it kind of uh, informs what happens between the two later in the episode. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it is a really flirty scene. Again, this is a show told through perspectives. And this is being told through Chester's perspective. And the way that he views it is the way that you did, which is that there's tension there and there's romance and... We were very deliberate in the writing to to never make Sam do anything overtly that would be, mm-hmm. you know, he never does anything that's overtly romantic. Chester, it's all interpreted uh, by Chester that way and the audience that way, frankly. So I think that this is one of those moments that feels because we want them to be together. Like, and I say this not <laughs> even as somebody that works on this show. I say this as an audience member because I personally want them to be together. That's how I'm watching that scene, too. Because this was shot at night, I think that there was um, a big opportunity to focus on the lighting and the visuals of this episode, like the lens flares, all that stuff, which I am also so interested in. Again, it's like that behind the scenes, same with the writing, same with like hair makeup. Like I love that aspect of this because I think there's a story can be told in so many different ways and emotion can be conveyed through different mediums and one of those is is lighting which this episode just felt so dreamy and like it just I don't know it made you it like you're right Wembley it made you feel like you wanted to be there and on top of all of that there was definitely like a romantic sense because of the lighting and it was just moody and just really gorgeous so um I I'm I'm curious if you could talk about the approaches to that aspect of of this show Daniel in particular, you know, he's a director. He has such a strong interest in capturing 
what LA really looks like and what these kids would actually be seeing. And like, this is such a crappy motel and it's kind of gross, but there's sort of a beauty in it too. Like he loves all the um, wires in LA and like you always see those, those wides of like the palm trees, but he's like, but there are also telephone wires everywhere. And like that's, and if you capture it well, it'll still be beautiful. And I think that we also have incredible DPs on this show who made it look so good. It, they, they didn't cheat anything. Like that's all real lighting. That's all, you know, that's all in camera, but it looks, gorgeous it's yeah we're, we're really lucky we have such, such we have two really excellent dps on the show who who wanted to have that sort of like dream like dream like maybe nightmare like you know slightly fancy yeah. look <laughs> it was gorgeous <laughs> yeah i remember walking into the the set the motel room that they replicated on the the sound stages and thinking it was so cool just the greens and the just the tones just the direction that they took with the set deck is uh, uh, amazing and yeah they had a fog machine going and I, I didn't really know like when I saw the episode I, I had the same reaction I'm like this is a beautiful episode I love looking at this and the old kind of rundown motel just works so well it's the first time in my life I've been like yes sign me up for this stunning motel, motel. <laughs> I know I think a lot of people stayed in the I think we might have like bought out the the production bought out the motel or something when we were shooting. But I remember one of the holding rooms, I dropped something on the floor and I like went down to pick it up and there were open condoms like <laughs> on the floor <laughs> of this rag- raggedy motel. I immediately oh, took a video oh and I God. sent it to the cast group chat. I'm like, look where we are shooting. <laughs> they said, look, we're staying authentic. <laughs> it authentic. is authentic, baby. This motel feels... Like one big liminal space. And I am not, again, a linguist or anything, but, you know, liminal space, you're kind of crossing over from one one place into another. And when you're in this liminal space, you leave something behind. And I think that every single character leaves a part of themselves or whether it's, you know, they're maturing or whatever, like, I think this, like, space, this moment, this this episode, like, everybody leaves it changed. And I would love to know from everyone, where do we think everyone is mentally right now, given that this does feel like a very big pivotal moment? Same. I feel like everyone's either been pushed off the side of a mountain or they've jumped themselves. <laughs> um, and they're sort of in, like, a free fall. And we'll see where they land. yeah. A lot of things that we've been building all season are sort of coming to a head, but I don't think the characters thought about what would come next. Even like Chester and Sam, like he made this overture and now what? I love that we described that though, uh, Wembley. It's a liminal space. That's so beautiful the way you described this episode. Yeah, I think that it was a big bonding moment for at least Naomi. Um, But it was also an unbonding moment for a lot of people. And a lot of uncertainty. And, and like you said, it's like I kind of held my breath at the end of the, the the last scene of this episode. But it's not the last episode of the mid-season finale. That is, is next not. week. So Ooh. we get a little bit more. <laughs> we have a lot to look forward to, you know, like Delilah to belly flop into, depending on, on where you're at right Oy. now. Um, but this truly has been... So, so lovely, Sono and Chloe. Like, thank you so much for, for being here, lending your perspective, your stories, your brilliance. And um, thank you for going toe to toe with me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I couldn't say more, but uh, uh, sorry, I couldn't guys. say more. Thank you for having us. Sorry, I couldn't say more. Oh, my God. I th- Seriously, so much fun talking to you both. And um, once again, we will be here every single week breaking down each episode with the show's creators, writers, and stars. And it's going to be a blast. So everyone have a lovely day. Stay safe and talk to you soon. Generation the Podcast is a production of HBO Max and iHeartRadio. Hosted by us, Gigi Good and Wembley Sewell. The podcast is produced and written by Phoebe Hunter, written and researched by Sierra Kaiser, and engineered, edited, and mixed by Matt Stillo. It's executive produced by Ethan Fixell. If you haven't already subscribed, rated, or reviewed Generation the Podcast, please do so on the iHeartRadio app, HBO Max, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, be sure to watch the series itself on HBO Max. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week. 